And so your faith with the breath of the Lord, when the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. May God add his blessing to our reading of Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 8. We have a symbol for fellowship with God and his word, which every one of those words is important to you who are Preston City Bible Church here at this meeting house that I affectionately refer to this beloved old meeting house as Fort Preston because we are at war and you're here to refit and refuel and resupply. Um, We are at war, but we're here for fellowship with God. Fellowship with God, uh, according to the Apostle John, depends on your fellowship with the apostles in 1 John chapter 1, which means your intake and and status quo of being filled with that precious Word of God. If the Word of God is richly dwelling within you, then you have fellowship with in other words, with God. Now, that's an application of 1 John chapter 1, where the apostle says that our fellowship was with God, and so you can have fellowship with us, the apostles. So, uh, in other words, we are, by God's decree and fiat, in a ministry, in a, in a time when we have to be in tune with the content of Scripture, with what the apostles have said in submission to, to their uh, teaching, and, uh, and, of course, the Old Testament prophets, so that we will know the mind of Christ so that we will know what God thinks and expects of us, and so that we will know what it is He expects uh, for us to choose to do with uh, that which is our responsibility, our own choices. So we've assembled by our choice tonight to lay hold of that precious fellowship in the Word of God so that we'll be equipped to think His thoughts in the days ahead and even in the moments that we spend together tonight. This requires the work of the Spirit in us, for the supernatural work is not just academic cognition. It is the spiritual indoctrination or inculcation or edification of these thoughts that man didn't think that we actually got directly from God or the apostles did, and we get from the apostles. And so we assemble tonight for this worship, and it requires the Spirit's presence and power in us. If, you've been, if you are a believer in Christ, like the Galatians who are said to be fallen from grace and severed from Christ... If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then you have the Holy Spirit, as Paul says the Galatians do. Those who are fallen from grace and severed from Christ, these believing but sinful and carnal Galatians are perhaps like you. You have the Holy Spirit. But like the Galatians, perhaps you are quenching or grieving the Holy Spirit through personal sin that you perpetuate, that you resign and walk in sin, which is the functional death, the tragedy of the walking death, the zombie believer. That's what it is to hold on to sin and not confess it. One sin that you might not have considered is neglect of God, neglect of His Word. When He commands you to pay attention and you say, eh, not so important. Well, not tonight. So we'll take a moment for silent prayer. If we confess our sins, He God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you with gratitude, with uh, the, uh, the desire to know you, with the obedient hearts that uh, have understood the command to draw near to you, that you would draw near to us. We do that this evening, Father, in seeking to know your counsel. Lord, our lives are insignificant and carry no value if you have not spoken so that you could construe for us what reality really is. But you have done so in your word, and so our lives do have significance and meaning and value. And we praise you for that blessing, for we would be adrift, cast about on every wind of doctrine, if we did not have this concrete truth that you present in your word. And tonight, it's our prayer that you would give us uh, the perspective in your word that you desire us to have, so that we'd be discerning and careful in thinking through what you have for us. We ask that we would be equipped to be worshipful in our daily choices, not to think, what do I think is the best thing, but what have you told us? What do we know from your precious word? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll turn me to Galatians chapter 6 this evening. We have been discussing the uh, horror of self-deception that comes up repeatedly in this particular passage. Self-deception being the um, other side or the opposite of what God would do with you if you would pay attention to his word. Because you and your old sin nature from, from the, the, the factory, you are uh, equipped for self-deception, for rationalization, 
for all, all kinds of mind games you can play with yourself to convince yourself that what you want or what you think is what truly is. And the more you practice this skill, the worse it gets. And these Galatians are in it pretty bad. So the Apostle Paul is closing down his epistle to them, which we've noted uh, repeatedly is a punitive epistle. And he is calling upon them to interact correctly within what I would call divine institution number four. And you would say, well, what is divine institution number four? Well, uh, past pastors, pastors of the past have said, well, one, two, three, four, number four would be nation or uh, civil government. And I think that that's a, um, a that's number five. Now, um, maybe number five should be church and uh, civil government should be number four because of chrono- chronological sequence. And my, my point is not to give you the, the, the order. Um, I might need to think that one through um, before I go changing the numbers around. But my point is, um, we watch the scriptures and we see God ordaining authority structures and he's telling them they need to function correctly within the local church. They're not functioning correctly within the local church because they're fleshly, they're carnal, they're not walking by the spirit. And that's why we get this wonderful, very clear command that gives us all we need to understand how it is that we're living by grace and yet we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. God is the one working in you. In Philippians 2.13, God is working in you to will and to work for his pleasure. And so walking by the spirit is the same idea. It's the same principle. God is working in you. You walk in the power supplied, the means supplied by God, the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5. And so what's happening in in the churches in Galatia or the church in Galatia, uh, probably churches, multiple churches in this Roman province of Galatia. Uh, Lystra, Derby, Iconium. What's happening in these churches is they've listened to false teachers and the function of the local church has completely broken down because the teaching is what drives the practice because the communication of the word of God is what drives the practice. And that's why you're going to read you who have been catechized. I'm sorry, you didn't read it that way, but uh, verse six of chapter six, the one who has taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. The one who has taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. You see, they need to be corrected or instructed on something that should be common sense. That Paul says repeatedly through the scriptures, this church doesn't need a whole lot of instruction on this. We always need instruction. We always need reinforcement. You're not giving, by the way, uh, primarily to the pastor, as he's describing, to share all good things. You're giving to God when you give, but this is a giving passage. But you have to understand the context in which this is happening is these people have broken down in their function in the church. And so Paul's having to address it. Listen to it in chapter five. um, Verse uh, what's verse twenty five. If we live by the spirit, let us also walk by the spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging, challenging one another, envying one another. That's not unity in the body of Christ. That's not unity in the local assembly, who, which is grounded in the word of God. You see, something has replaced the sound teaching of God, the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul. With fa- the false doctrine has come in, and now there is no unity in the spirit. There is no bond of peace, and so these people are broken as a church. And this is one of Paul's punitive epistles to the, to the churches. And you know, we've done this introduction several times, but it bears some reflection. I don't want to be a Galatian. I don't want to be this kind of Christian who has disregarded sound teaching from Paul, embraced false teaching from someone who's less than Paul, claiming to have a better understanding of Paul or than Paul. I've rejected Paul. I've embraced false teaching. And now I'm biting and devouring one another in the church. And so Paul shows you uh, through this passage two things. In chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, you see the general application, the general application of the fruit of the spirit in the local assembly, bearing one another's burdens, not because, well, if they give, then I'll give, but because God has given. And so I'm responsible to him. So I'll bear my own load, how we function with one another. And then he moves from the application to the teaching that produced that application. He sort of went backwards. He started with the application of verses one through five of love, fulfilling the law of Christ. And then he goes to verse six, how we received that ability to love how we understand that this is the law of Christ. We've been catechized. And that's the word here in Greek. The one who is taught. The one who is taught. And I'll put that word on the screen uh, tonight. Because it's so vital to get the connection between the teaching of the word of God and its application. The teaching of the word of God and its application. And if you don't include the power in which that is taught 
And when it is applied, which is the Holy Spirit, His power, if you don't include the power, then you don't have the whole package, you don't have the full picture, and you will still be trying to spin your wheels in some sort of uh, academic enterprise that is not empowered by the Spirit of God. Empowered by the Spirit of God through the propositions, personal power of God through the propositions of His Word. And so what we've got in verse 6 is this great word, uh, kate keo, kate keo, k a t e c h e omega, kate, uh, sorry, kate keo, kate, that's a long e, c h uh, e o, kate keo, can't transliterate and write the same, okay, kate keo. What does this word mean? This word is from for the, the, the root or the, uh, the, the origin, the etymology for the word catechism. C-H-I-S-M. Catechism. You with a Roman Catholic background understanding, they know about, you know about catechism. Got to go through the catechism. Well, um, there's been all kinds of, uh, of uh, catechisms through the church history. And uh, the Reformed Church had their catechism. And it's basically a system of question and answer where you teach little children uh, how to do, uh, how, how to, to think through uh, what we would call a doctrinal statement. Okay, it is, it, that's, that's what catechism means in English. Now, catecheo does not mean, katecheo does not mean that specifically. Um, but that's what has been done with it for the training of little children. So the person that reads the question and the little kid answers the question, what's the chief end of man to enjoy God, to, to, uh, to glorify God and enjoy him forever? Well, um, that's not what he means by the one teaching or catechizing as he uses. It's both the person who teaches, katecheo, and the person who is taught, katecheo. They're both participial forms of this verb. It's not a common verb Paul uses, but it's an interesting verb because when Paul uses this verb, he is, uh, in Romans chapter 2, he's talking about the law. In Romans chapter 2, Paul uses this particular verb with respect to the Mosaic law. Let me see if I can remember where that verse is. Romans 2.18. Verse 17 of Romans chapter 2 says, But if you bear the name of Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God. See, Paul is setting up everybody in Romans 1-3 through as needing justification from an external source. You're not going to get there on your own works. And so he's, he's moving from the moralist now to the Jew. And you know his will and approve the things that are essential, being catechized or katekeo, being instructed out of the law. Now, now hold that together because Paul doesn't use this word very much, but he uses it here. He uses it one place in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 14, which we're not going to go to tonight. But look at what he does in chapter 6, back to Galatians 6. The one who is katekeo, who is taught, remember what he said in verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ. Now, some people misappropriate Jeremiah 31 and what it promises about writing the law of God on Israel's hearts. And they think that we are in the new covenant now and it has been fully ratified and inaugurated so that you don't need your brother to teach you for you already know the law of God. And this book is proof positive that that's a misapplication of Jeremiah 31 because these people needed to be taught. They had good teaching. They received after the good teaching of Paul, the false teaching of the Judaizers. And now they are completely carnal. And that's where you will be individually or this church will be collectively if we embrace false teaching. You see, we must be taught. And so there it is, the one who is taught. But this word Paul uses refers in Romans chapter 2, interestingly, I'm not saying it means this every time, but he refers to the instruction that the Jews received out of the law. It's, it, in other words, I contend, this, this word means inculcation indoctrination, a thorough assimilation at the genetic level, if you will, of what God expects of us. And we, to be able to have this, we've got to be able to prioritize. You know, it's been called the basics or the fundamentals of the Christian faith or, or just check out your doctrinal statement. We haven't taught the doctrinal statement in a long time. 
But just who is God is really, we've asked, asked that question hundreds of times since I've been here. And we've answered it with God's your creator. He's your savior and he's your judge. That's the, that's the fundamental of who God is in, in his self-revelation. He's the creator. And you, you worship him in that sense that you exist because he's here. And, and we're not going to get into all the fundamentals of our doctrinal statement. But he's not just, uh, uh, he's not just uh, singularity. He's one God who exists as three persons. And if you have a God who isn't triune, you don't have the God of the scriptures. If you have a God who has the father is on a different plane of existence than his lesser emanation, the son. You don't have Christianity. You don't have the scriptures. You don't have what God reveals of himself. We have one God who exists eternally in three persons. I can show you that in several little places in the New Testament that to hold these things together, we have to conclude that Jesus is God. And yet Jesus is not his father, who is also God. And yet we don't have two gods. And so you have this classic ancient Christian doctrine of Trinitas, as Tertullian said it, um, developed early in the church and its understanding, but actually presented in the scriptures. The word Trinitas doesn't occur, but we need a categorical term. So we have the fundamentals of the faith and we know who God is. We know who man is. And here's the great problem with your culture. When the culture loses its Christian impact, man stops believing that he's sinful. And when man stops believing that he's sinful, he starts thinking that he's going to be able to fix stuff that he can't fix. When man stops believing that man is at bottom self-destructive. And so every human institution is self-destructive. And self, self-glorifying self and God-rejecting. When we stop thinking that everyone is a sinner, desperately in need of God's direct intervention. When we stop believing this way about mankind, just by way of application, we start making up great ideas and utopian solutions that never work. And the greater and grander the scheme, the more millions of people in the 20th century are killed by the, own, the, the country that tries to implement these great ideas. Because... What the Bible says is not only is God infinitely good, but man is fallen and sinful. He's depraved and he needs a savior. And you're not sinful because you started sinning and you got you got the feel for it as a kid. You're sinful because you're in Adam and Adam's sinful and that sin is applied to you. And so you're born condemned and you need a savior from the very beginning of your life because we're in Adam. And that's not just that we're sinful. We are sinful, but we're sinful because we're in Adam. And see, these are the fundamentals of the faith that Paul develops in Galatians and in Romans. And so these things uh, we have to inculcate, we have to indoctrinate so that when we come up against the bad idea that, well, you're not really sinful, but you do need to be circumcised. Wait a second. All we like sheep have gone astray. We read it in Isaiah 53. You, Israel, are responsible. You, Judaizers, are responsible for believing this total depravity problem. And we're not going to cover it by removing some skin. And what, what, what that pointed to has been accomplished in Christ and, uh, without hands. And, uh, and, and so, in other words, this catechesis, this indoctrination of the fundamentals is, uh, is a vital practice because it's supposed to produce chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. You're supposed to be a Christian who not only knows who God is and who you are in relation to Him. You're a sinner. Saved by grace. You will never get what you deserve, the lake of fire, for just your choices today. You'll never get what you deserve, but you will get what Jesus deserves because your position is in Christ. Contrary, uh, on the other hand, Jesus Christ did not, uh, got what he didn't deserve and couldn't deserve at the cross, what you did deserve. And uh, he never could deserve that. And, uh, and so it's, it's that substitution principle, you see. This is the fundamentals of the faith. That Not only are you a sinner, but you're saved by grace, not your works. And so these things are inculcated. And so you go forth with the gospel. And you know that we just handled the great problem. I talked to Jim about this from time to time. The great problem out there for the scoffing elite or the scoffing rank and file or whoever, the scoffing white collar or the scoffing blue collar that says, well, the problem with Christianity is all the hypocrisy. All these hypocrites. No, I didn't say that I wasn't a sinner who needed God's grace. I said you were. But I am, too. And the the Christian confession isn't that I am righteous by my own works. The Christian confession is that God looks at me as righteous because of what Jesus has done and that I need to grow into that righteousness. That's called sanctification. But the Christian confession has never been that we are sinless or that we are perfect or that we have stopped 
uh, dealing with the problem and pressure of the sin nature. See, that, that's never been a Christian. That's, that's a, just, a, that's just a, a cop out. If you really want to know what Christians believe, then listen to them. You see, that's, that's the real thing. But see, we just handled that whole nonsense because we've established God's grace. And we figured out who God is, who man is, and who you are, regenerate man, a sinner saved by grace. Not by your works, but by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And having established this, now we are, that we need really to figure out what we should do. I mean, this is something you tell a new believer on day one, and they grow into this thing, and they never outgrow it. You say, there's your Ferrari, now let's go drive it. What am I supposed to do? Now, the baby can't drive a Ferrari, but he certainly has one. You grow into this, uh, this ground piloting of a Ferrari. You grow into this work of, of actually making that machine perform at its maximum potential. And what does this growth mean? It means that you do what is expected of you. What is expected of you? That you would know God and that you would obey God. And God has a law for you. Can you summarize what God expects of the church age believer? Because many believers can't. Well, God expects you to obey him. Good. That's a great start because you've been bought with a price. And so obey the one who owns you. It's great news. You do not belong to Satan and his kingdom of darkness. You belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of, of his light. So now what? Well, you've got to obey God. Stop sinning. Well, okay. You're not supposed to sin. You're supposed to choose not to sin. You're supposed to reject sin and embrace righteousness. And when you fail... We have an advocate with Jesus, uh, with, with God the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous in 1 John 2, 2. Okay, but that's not the Christian life. Stop sinning. We haven't got there to the law of Christ yet. You cannot legislate the law of Christ. I mean, you can't legislate against sin and call it the law of Christ. The Mosaic law did that. We are called to walk by the Spirit and the infinite power of God the Holy Spirit. We're back to the fundamentals again. When you believed in Christ, you were imputed forever. With the Holy Spirit. He resides in your heart and he's residing to stay. And he's there to make your heart the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I don't mean the pump. That if you get a transplant, you got to get regenerate again. I mean the heart of man, the immaterial core of your being. That when the body and the pump are in the grave, that part is with God. When you are with, in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, your heart is there. And remember that. Now that heart, that has the Holy Spirit resident in that heart to to empower you, to, to erect in you the temple, his temple for his residence, makes you the walking, talking temple in your body of the Holy Spirit. That's who you are. Now, what is the law of Christ? We dealt, we dealt with this for weeks. The law of Christ, the summary command for the church age, is that you love one another as Christ loves you. That's the summary. Did you know that when I set you up with a little exam a minute ago? That's it. The, the law of Christ is not get a tape a day. The law of Christ is not uh, merely to intake the word of God. And James, in the, in the epistle, the early epistle of James, deals with that. Babies need to grow through that one really quickly. We don't just listen. We're not just hearers of the word. We do the word. We obey it. And the summary command for you is to love what God loves in the way that he loves it. Love one another just as I've loved you that you would love one another, Jesus says in John 13, 34. That's the command that is the summary law of Jesus Christ. That's our command. And we just said, okay, now we're in, uh, we're in fantasy land. This is impossible. But no, it's not because you have the Holy Spirit. What is impossible for you is infinitely possible for him. It's a cakewalk. It's, it's, it's nothing. It's, it's just the easiest thing in the world for God, the Holy Spirit, and uh, his power to shed abroad his love through you so that you are equipped in the fruit of the Spirit to love. Okay, that's the Christian life. And so I hope you're catechized. I hope you understand these are the fundamentals. And we could, we could count, what is that, five, six things? We could walk through those things. Who is God? Who is man? Who am I being regenerate man? What does the Holy Spirit mean uh, with respect to this? Because this is the church age. And now what does God expect of me? And uh, that's what he's getting at. See, they're not even off the, they haven't even left home plate of the Christian life. And they're, they're, they're due at, at second base here. Uh, to use a baseball analogy. So the one who has taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches. And now that verse is talking about giving. It's talking about giving specifically to the pastor. The one who does this inculcation work. Now notice it doesn't say the one who preaches uh, a, a poetic homily. 
It says the one who teaches him, and that, we said, means inculcation, an indoctrination-type teaching, where we would never think circumcision saves us because we've been, like Paul says the Galatians, Jesus Christ has publicly been portrayed as crucified for us. And so, because we understand that infinite God took on finite flesh in order to die on the cross and be buried and ro- raised again on the third day, because of this event, God has saved us by His grace, by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so we would never, ever, ever say that I'm going to shed my blood in circumcision to be saved. What an idiotic thought. And that's why they're severed from Christ, because they believed a false gospel. They've rejected the gospel of grace, and by so much, they are separated from the thinking of Christ. They're, celebra- they're se- separated, therefore, from fellowship with Christ because it depends on his content, his thinking. And so, verses 1 through 5, okay, uh, follow from chapter 5, which says, Walk by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the power. 6 verses 1 through 5 is the application of that power in your assembly. And that continues in the specific instance of the one who teaches you that law of Christ who equips you to love. The Apostle Paul uh, echoes this thought, with, which he's saying here in 1 Timothy 1. You've heard me say it. 1 Timothy 1, 5. The goal of our instruction is love. It's love. And if we, if we miss that, we go to 1 Corinthians 13, we, we've missed it big time. I don't care how much you give or what, even if your body to be burned, the most valuable thing you could ever possess. If you give that to be burned, it's nothing if you have not love. And so we've got to get this in focus. But the question is, how do I do it? How do I love? Well, it's, we've, we've answered it for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. We do it in the power of God, the Holy Spirit. We recognize our responsibility, and you don't get this, un, this confused. And you know what I'm going to say about balance. You don't say that I can't on God's commands to you. You say that in my flesh I can't, but in the Spirit I'm responsible and I can Because your responsibility is to obey and to choose. And God's responsibility is to supply the power. And don't get those confused. So when when you are told a command from Scripture, you understand, you have to say, I not only can, but I must. Because it's a command of the living God. And I'm not sure how he's going to empower me to do this. Maybe that's true. I don't know how he's going to make me able. But I know he says that I must do it. And therefore, I assume he will make me able. You see, that's the Christian life. And you never get this out. Well, I can't love such and such a person. I, you know, you don't know what they've done to me. I, I'm not in a position to evaluate your personal experience. I'm in a position to say from the word of God that you're responsible to love that person and therefore capable. And what you've done is made a mistake by saying you can't when that's God's business. The question is, will you? That's your business. Because God's already got I can covered. And believers, and this is a great time in your life. If you ever got one of those things where you're like, I just can't do this one. That's a great point to show you that all the other stuff you thought you could do. Let's evaluate. Am I walking by the spirit in that stuff, too? Well, I, he wants me to do this, this, this. I got this covered, this covered, this covered. But I'm really not. I'm really not able to do this one. Well, how were you doing the others? Were you doing it in the power of the spirit or were you able to plug that many holes in the dam? And then you just ran out of fingers and toes. Because God brings you to the end of yourself and says, I'm supposed to be empowering you for all of this. You're supposed to be choosing it, and I'm supposed to be equipping it. And I think sometimes he brings us, I think that's one thing he might have done with Paul in 2 Corinthians 12. When, when you're completely helpless, my power is brought to its full maturity, my, its full expression. When you're completely helpless. Lord, I will choose, but you must supply the ability, or else it's not grace and I don't want it. We say, uh, we sing at every communion or almost every communion, that when I survey the wondrous cross, when I survey the wondrous cross, based on a Gregorian chant uh, rendered into English by Isaac Watts, forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. In Galatians 6.14, may it never be that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, did you know that that's a quote of Scripture when we sing that? He's doing Galatians. Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. A total death has occurred between you and the world. And that's what I mean when I talk about Christians walking around as zombies. I'm part of the world. You walk around as walking death where you try to be the world 
But you've died to it if you've been crucified with Christ. And so you're trying to be this living death, and it's horrible. It's a, it's a monstrosity. It stinks. If you're dead to the world, act like it. And, and see, these are the fundamentals of the Christian faith. And this is what Paul is teaching. But let's zoom in now um, on what he does in chapter 6, verse 6. After saying you have a load to bear and bearing one another's burdens, that you don't think of yourself more than you ought to think of be self-deceived, he then goes on to say the one who has taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him or who, who teaches. The one who has taught, passive voice, is to share with the one who teaches the one who is taught, as we said, that that's the word kate keo, and it means uh, to instruct in a, uh, in a categorical and um, lucid way that indoctrinates so that you are protected by that teaching from error that exists outside. And that's, in my understanding, that's the work of the pastor. That's really why we have pastors. In First Thess 5, the command is to love those who stand in front literally. It's the same type of a reference. They say that the, the Bible doesn't refer to pastors. It's talking about pastors here. It talks about pastors in 1 Corinthians 5.13. Whenever Paul talks about uh, the establishment and function of the local church, like he's doing here, he mentions them by their function. And so pastors that don't uh, kate keo, their churches, their congregations, are guilty before God of mishandling their responsibility. They haven't carried out their, their job and they're not protecting their flock from false doctrine by that indoctrination. Now, here's the problem with indoctrination. You will, if you listen carefully and you take it down and you absorb it, you might at some point think, well, where did he get that? Well, that's part of the ministry here is we're constantly showing. We're in Galatians 6.6. 6. The application of verses 1 through 5 is explained in part by the teaching in verse 6. I mean, I'm making that connection. And so now you have that. And maybe you'll read through this again sometime and say, hey, there's something, yeah, there's that connection. Oh, yeah, remember that. And we constantly are trying to show where we got it, but we also need to be able to summarize and categorize. How does it fit? How, let me just show you something about this idea of where it came from. Where did it come from? Well, it came from my pastor. If you could just sit down and talk with him for a little while, maybe you'd be squared away. That's one approach once you've been... Uh, categorize so that you understand the scriptures, but it's not a sufficient approach because if you ever put the authority of the teaching of the word of God in the human being teaching it rather than the content he's teaching itself, then you've misappropriated what Paul says. Look at verse one of chapter one when Paul tells you what he's doing. Verse one, Paul, an apostle, not from man or through the agency of man, not from man or by man, not sourced in man. I didn't. I'm not an apostle with authority from man. I'm not apostle sent by man. I am one sent from God. But through the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Who am I? I'm a guy that just has a message. I'm a sheepdog or I'm a pack mule carrying a message from the boss. And, uh, and I know the road to, that he wants me to go on, so I just carry his message. That's the idea. I'm not sent by man. I didn't get it from Peter. You can't come behind me and say, well, you know, we are Peter's students and we know better. You can't do that. You can't say, well, Paul came from Gamaliel, uh, the rabbi and Tarsus. And so we're going to square you away on a better understanding. Can't do that because Paul says I wasn't sent by man. I wasn't made an apostle by man. I was sent from God. And that's where the authority lies. This is the, where the issue is. And Paul in chapter one, verses 11 um, through two. 21, the bulk of the first two chapters of Galatians, is a defense of that fact. It's a historical, biographical, autobiographical sketch reviewing where did Paul get this. He didn't get it from Peter. He didn't get it from any human being except the risen Christ, the God-man. That's where he got this. And see, when that authority is understood, Galatians is a wonderful gift in that way. It's a treasure of telling you where the authority lies. It doesn't lie in the pastor. It lies in the teaching of the Word of God. And see, when you're like, well, I think this doesn't square, the pastor better have an answer. You see, I, I don't really understand. Okay, so you got James 2, 14 through 26, meaning that I don't have to work to be saved, but I don't see how that works. The pastor better have an answer for that one. Well, but Hebrews 5 seems to say that they're dull of hearing, but Hebrews 6 says that they've been burned up, and so I think that's them going to hell. 
I've got an answer for that. And it doesn't contradict what Paul says. And you are saved by grace through faith. And you didn't do anything to earn or deserve it. And you don't keep yourself saved. Back to the fundamentals. You see, and, and these protect you from the false ideas that creep in, that have creeped in in Galatia that Paul has dealt with. Now, thousands of errors have been perpetrated in the church history. Thousands of mistakes. This is one that we're going to do the works of the law, especially surgery. We're not going to do all the works of the law, but we are going to do some of them. And so we're going to do the surgery thing. And, um, and uh, you know, there's no way they can obey the commands to sacrifice in the temple. Uh, uh, well, actually, the Galatians could go to Jerusalem still at this point, but there's coming a time in 22 years or so that they couldn't because the temple would be destroyed. But, I mean, they're not doing the Mosaic Law. They're just doing this one thing. And Paul has spent a lot of time doctrinally developing. That's not how you're saved. Nobody was ever saved that way. Abraham wasn't saved by circumcision, but God did tell him to be circumcised. Abraham was saved by grace through faith, just like you. Galatians, or Genesis 15, 6. He had believed. And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And that's God's justification for faith. And this is so much of the doctrine Paul has developed. Now, there are thousands of errors that have been developed through church history. Galatians shows you how to handle them. You go back to who's the authority? God. Where has he reposed his authority that's delegated? In his word. What do we do? We submit to that as the apostles have communicated. And that's why we spend time here. And so the one who is taught is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. That, that's to point out... That's to point out that in this indoctrination and an inculcating ministry that protects you, that makes the local church the pillar in defense of the word, that makes you able to go forth with the word of God and not be compromised by false teachers, but share the love of Christ. And it's not phony and it's not your personality working through and you're just a beaming person, but it's really the, the love of Christ shed abroad in your heart. When this is true, you are infinitely wealthy. And that's a great and good and, and blessed thing that's been done for you by God's agency and his protocol system called the one who teaches. And so notice the word all good things. All good things. Agathos. Agathos. Good of intrinsic value things. Now, he does not say money here. And this has been uh, used too specifically to mean money. It doesn't mean money. But it does mean all good things. I don't mean don't show up with eggs either. You know, or or chickens or, you know, um, coupons. I mean, I share all good things. But I'm just saying it's if you restrict this to money, then this this is what's happened with money. Watch what happens in America before as the city started to form. We used to have societies of people that were Christians that wanted to help that were in their churches or outside their churches. They had these societies develop that were interested in helping the poor because the cities have congregations of poor people. They don't exist out in the country because you can be a farmhand out there and you'll at least live. But in the cities, especially, I mean, everybody out in the country is poor, right? But in the city, the poor people congregate. So in the old days, before the the system of uh, cut a check and uh, don't think about it, the people in the cities that had means policed themselves and developed these societies that would care for the poor and indigent. What happened? We noticed that it takes time and effort and heartache to deal with people. For you think about this as a church, what we would do is we would have the light on. We'd have like a day set up. We'd have wood for people to chop. We'd have work for them to do. We'd have it organized and people would be hungry and say, yes, I'll come do that. Because if you don't at work, you won't eat. That's the scriptures. And you don't you don't do a man a favor by not enabling him to work. You don't you do him a great disservice and enslave him when you don't require his work, but you provide his means. And so we would that's what they do. They would if if somebody didn't really want to work, they weren't going to get the provisions of the hardworking people in the church. But they would organize this and all through the cities in the 19th century, as the cities were developing, they had this wonderful thing with these missionary societies where the people were uh, they had. You've heard of the mission church downtown. This church would have a church downtown. And uh, the, the associate pastors in this church would work that, that mission and they would, uh, they would be an evangelistic outreach and it would feed people and we'd go where they were and so forth. What happened? We started cutting checks and no longer are we accountable to individuals. The people with the means, who are providing the means, who are working and the people work, who provide that accountability, it's no longer there. Now we, we have a bureaucracy, social workers, nothing against social workers, I know some. Uh, I'm friends with with some of them that I've met. I try to befriend everyone I meet. 
And, uh, but, but the system I'm talking about, what we've done is we've depersonalized something. We started cutting checks. We stopped sharing. We stopped sharing our experience, our concern. You don't love someone with a piece of paper necessarily. A piece of paper, as we all know on Valentine's Day, can be a wonderful expression of love. But that's not the only way you share. And I'm just using this tragedy of American compassion, as Marvin Olasky called it. I'm using this example of our history where we've really lost something in the personal accountability, in the decentralized system, in the the lack of burden on the federal tax system, all kinds of benefits to locally policing this at the at the lowest possible level from the philanthropy and the charity of the hearts of the Christians and uh, and the givers out there. We've we've completely undone this by cutting checks, and now you just you just got your benefits, you just got your checks, and uh, nobody is in your life, and nobody's saying this isn't any way to live. In fact, it's quite a nice living. And, and so that example of the depersonalization of charity in the United States, charity, by the way, means love. Don't, don't think charity means something demeaning or degrading. Charity means love. It means we love, so we give. It's an expression, a tangible expression of someone's love. And when it's not that, it's not charity in, in terms of what these words mean. It comes from the word grace. Charis, grace. And so... Um, Share all good things is not, you're not just doing this by cutting a check. Because this word to share is probably the last word we'll be able to to kind of work through tonight. It's one of my favorite words. It's the first word in the sentence. It's a present uh, active imperative from koinoneo. Let me put it on the screen for you. Okay. Longo. Oh, short of oin, no, neo. K o i n o long o, in, sorry, in, uh, e long o. Koino neo. Isn't that a beautiful word? It's a word we use as a stock and trade word. We use it all the time. It's one of our key theological categories. You have it in your Bible, share. Uh, do you have a King James? Uh, do you have a King James there? You don't have to look. No, it's okay. But King James, I happen to know that it says communicate. Share and communicate. How? Okay, communicate all good things. Like um, Red one, this is black six, radio check over. I am here to communicate all good things. All good things to you, over. Uh, Roger, black six, uh, this is red one, over. A black six out. You know, that's not that's not what we're talking about. Communicate all good things. Let me get you. Let me text text you, and we'll talk later. Share all good things. If I told you that this is the verb for this word, you would understand. Fellowship. Problem is English. English is just a mess. Fellowship means we're peers, in its etymology. We're fellows. We're all fellows at the same level of attainment, so we call ourselves a fellowship. You know, we're in, we're in this enterprise together as peers. That's not what we mean when we use this word. We mean that we're sharing something in common. It means that we're eating out of the same bowl of popcorn, if you will. Okay. It means that we have the same meal together. That's why they call it a koinonia, a fellowship meal. You're to fellowship all good things. And it's an imperative. It's a command. By the way, we are not, and I'm teaching a thing on giving, and I'll be uh, leaning heavily on 6, 6, 7, and 8 uh, in, on Sundays, the next couple of weeks, to compare what we get in 2 Corinthians 9. But I want you to see that um, um, this is a command. It's imperative. Imperative means do it. It's one of those many thousand, a couple thousand commands in the New Testament that, you know, we're not under the law. 613 commands, right, we're under the thousands of commands in the New Testament. And, and this is not a, a tithe or a percentage. He doesn't say percent, give 10% of all good things. He says give a, give a share. But it's a command. Now, people that think the law is a command and grace is license are no commands. They don't understand law and grace. The, the reason we're in grace is we have the Holy Spirit. Who you can't legislate against the fruit of the Spirit. See, we've got a higher deal because we're empowered by the Spirit. 
to reject the sin nature. And we don't need the, the law to constantly say, ah, ah, you're over the line, you're over the line, you're over. But when you are out of fellowship, the law does say you just committed murder. The law does say you just committed adultery. You just committed uh, covetousness. You just were jealous. You just had an idol. The law still condemns you when you're out of fellowship. You're not under the law, but it still uses, it still works that way. And my point is, um, this partaking, this common ground, is a command to fellowship all good things, to have in common, to share all good things with those who teach, if you are taught. It's not that we're in grace that we don't have to give. You have to do this. It's a command. I have to do this. It's a command. You see? And so it's, it's vitally important to understand that, that it's not given as a percentage. There's no legalistic or other criteria proposed. It's just you share. And what do you share? All good things. And you're, you're like, well, um, okay. Well, all good things. It's actually in. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. You're not going to be able to see that anyway. In all good things. To share literally in plus the dative of pos. In all good things. It doesn't mean that you give, uh, if you have something nice, that you have to give it away. It means that you are obligated to share. And this is part of your spiritual life. This is part of your worship. And it isn't because you are necessarily giving to your pastor, those who indoctrinate. It's because you're giving to God as worship. And that's been the consistent thing all through history, is that you've all, we've always been required to uh, in Israel or now, we, the, the offering has always been for those who minister the word. But it's really an offering to God. It's important to keep that connected. And how would I make that connection in the scriptures? I mean, as a pastor, think about this with me. Just, just th- think as we close. It would be comfortable for me to say, you're not giving to me, you're giving to God. Because he says, share all things with those who teach. So now what? Share all good things with those who teach. Well, it says share it with, with the person who teaches, so, so that's you. Aha, but look what he does in verse 7. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. It's really about God. And you have to read the passage, that you, whatever your passage is, in context. It's, thankfully, it, it is comfortable that I can say this. <laughs> okay? But the reason I say it is because the Scripture is required. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Second Corinthians nine six. Well, you could look at it uh, on your own. Second Corinthians nine six says the exact same analogy under the same exact conditions. Giving in the church. Giving. Now, in that instance, we're taking up a collection for the poor in Jerusalem. It's not support of Paul. It's the support, support of other saints that aren't teaching. It's just supporting the Christians. And. Uh, Therefore, you have two categories, giving to those that teach and giving to those that uh, that need help. You see, the the, the Bible develops these categories. I don't develop them. I observe them and uh, I try to observe them with you. If you'll observe them with me, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. How is not sharing all things and all good things, sharing in all good things with those who teach? How is that mocking God if you fail to do it? See, there's your theological question you want to ponder. How am I mocking God if I don't do this? Well, he's got a command. I'm responsible to do it. See, Paul has already told them this. He always does this when he sets up a church. He, and I can tell you that because of verse 7, when he says you're mocking God if you don't do this, he's saying you already know this. See, they, they know this. They've been taught this. And they're mocking God by saying that uh, what, they re- what they sow and what they reap are not connected. But see, the agricultural illustration is common sense, as I've said. This is the common sense principle in God's economy of giving. If you want to reap big time, then you have to sow big time. It's a direct proportion. Actually, probably not a direct proportion. It's probably you reap more than you sow, but if you want to reap a lot, you have to sow a lot. And he makes that sort of one-to-one connection. Whatever a man sows, this thing he will also reap. And then he goes further theologically. The one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit. See, it's not that you're sowing to the pastor. He receives, just like the Levites in Israel received the offering that the people brought to God. Now, I'm not the priest. You're all priests. 
that there is a correlation between those who minister the word and those who ministered the word. And that correlation is fairly tight because all the illustrations that God was teaching Israel, the Levites had to do all those illustrations, the, the sacrificial system. The one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. The one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. And then verses 9 through 10 zoom out from the, the application of loving one another in sharing with those who teach to the whole church, to the whole family. And remember, those are two categories, those that teach receive their living from the word, from, from ministering the word of God, and those who are in need in the family. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So I want you to notice the symmetry of verse uh, 6, 1, where he talks about anyone who's hurting in the church, who's, who's um, caught in any trespass. Uh, verse 2, bear one another's burdens. Uh, don't you individuals think you think uh, you're something when you're nothing? You deceive yourself. Examine your work and you have reason for boasting with regard to yourself. And verse five, let, uh, you, you must bear your own load. Verse six, you with those who teach individually in your heart, you've got a responsibility for how you support the gospel. In other words, those who teach do not be deceived. God is not mocked. And now it's you and God and how you reap with God. And so with God and sowing to the spirit instead of sowing to your flesh. And then collectively, verse 9, we're back to the general picture of the family. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for we will reap if we don't grow, grow weary. But while we have an opportunity, we do good to all people, especially those who are of the household of faith. One last point I'd make on this little passage tonight is that word household. It keeps on uh, energizing me and to what a church is. Uh, it's my intention to um, pursue my next level of education um, at, at uh, theological seminary. My next level of education would be a Ph.D. program. And that would be um, 37 credits at the doctoral level. That's all. It takes three years. You have to write a book. And uh, you have to do a lot of original research, and it's a lot of work, and it will definitely feed my work here, with, especially with the seminary students and, uh, and in pulpit ministry. And um, the, the goal of the school I'm looking at is to really make pastors who are scholarly and uh, adept at research and uh, the original languages. And um, my intent is to write on ecclesiology, on what the church is. Because <clears throat> look at this word, verse 10, especially to those who are of the household of the faith. The household of the faith. See, Paul doesn't use the word local church. We throw that word around a lot. Some cultists have used that word. The local church movement. It's a great horror to behold. But this is... The, the household of the faith, that's, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about a household of households. It, when I was first working through what it means to be a pastor and to, to, to integrate and work with those worshiping here, you know, that was my first time to, to ever function as a pastor of a church in this church. And uh, as I was first working through that, where the, re the responsibilities are overlapping somehow. I've got, we've got accountability responsibilities to one another just right there in first, chapter 6, verse 1. And yet... There's also responsibility in households that fathers and, and mothers and children have that, that you don't break into. And there's that wall of separation by God's design. You, you don't break into someone's marriage or their family and start directing what is parental authority or, or husband-wife responsibilities. You don't bust into that. See, and, and what we are, we're a household of households. The local church is a household of households. And, and that's a dynamic interrelationship. And so, you know, it gets messy when the household is not completely in the church. You've got kind of a, a circle, a household that's not in the, in the circle. It's kind of overlapping, you see. And that causes all kinds of problems because, well, we're just not in the same household that we are. And these dynamics, this, this discussion, when Paul says you do good, especially those who are the household of the faith, uh, reminds us, first, that he's talking about function within a local church, and second, that there's an administration that is an authority structure. A household is a stewardship that is a, a place where work gets done, and it's under authority, and it's accountable. And um, so that's why divine institution number five would be the local church. Not the universal church. There's no hierarchy over the individual local church. But once you have one, that's an institution by God. And you know what the Lord Jesus says? He says, if you don't get it right, I'm going to blow your candle out to the churches in Asia Minor. 
If you don't get this right, I'm going to take away your candlestick. You're not going to get to be a church anymore because this isn't your institution. This is mine. And so um, vital things here in the ecclesiology, the basics in application of just pursuing the word of God and living it out. The problem in Galatia was certainly they had a flat tire. Though the flat tire was, the spike that, that caused it was the lack of the teaching of the Word of God, at least being held to. They rejected what Paul said, and they lost the, 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 they were compromised in their faith by false teaching. And the solution to that was Paul to come and give them correct teaching. And then to say, you need to keep supporting those that teach, because that's your defense. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, we thank you, Father, for the privilege of being the local church, being the part of the body of Christ universal. We thank you that this helps us specify what our responsibilities are. For we have our individual responsibilities. We each bear our own load. Father, we definitely want the boast that you were able to use us because we made the right choice. And we couldn't make choices for others. We could only choose for ourselves. But we definitely want that boast, Father, that Paul talks about. that We boast in the death of Christ our Savior through whom the world has been crucified to us and we to the world. It's my prayer that we would all walk in a manner worthy of our calling, that we would Take these uh, thoughts that we've uh, pursued tonight of the intake of the Word of God and its application, of the need for the fundamentals to be so deeply inculcated that we're able to answer and think them through and go to Scripture and, and point them out, not just take a human being's word for it. I pray that we would be equipped to defend the faith and be the pillar in defense for your Word that you've designed us to be. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.